Let me ask you a simple question. Which is your favorite color? Red? Green? Blue? Maybe purple? I'm kidding. Who likes purple? Have you chosen the color? And here is my second question. Which color is better? Red or yellow? Green or orange? Blue or, well, let it be purple, okay? So which one is better? Well, none. There isn't such thing as a better color. It can be your favorite color. You can personally like it, or it can match, or not match another color. But on the scale of better worse, none of the shades of the color spectrum can be put higher or lower than another. Even the exact sciences define color as a subjective characteristic of electromagnetic radiation. And although almost everyone can distinguish, for example, green from red, or yellow from orange, conversations what color is better or what shade of color are absolutely meaningless. Why is it so complicated and not unambiguous when talking about color? Let's try to figure it out. Another couple of seconds to effectively complete the opening scene. And we begin. Of course, Newton is to blame for everything. It's he who came up with the idea to break the continuous spectrum into separate colors. He decided that there should be seven colors, probably an analogy with seven notes. Owing to him, we clearly separate them from each other. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, purple. Using the famous mnemonic phrase, you can remember both colors and their sequence in the spectrum. Red is the fire truck, orange is the orange, yellow is the sun, green is the grass, blue is the sky, indigo is the sea, purple is the pheasant. Hmm, gotcha. These are the colors in reverse order. And the very phrase is, Richard of York gave battle in vain. And now a tricky question. How many colors are there? The spectrum is not called continuous for nothing. In it, one color gradually changes to another. We can only identify the brightest shades. Well, for example, is this more green or yellow? And is this blue or purple? It must be haunting us today. And now I'll give you a real surprise. What if you actually see only three colors? It sounds pretty crazy, but this is the real truth. It's all about the fact that we see colors with our eyes and our brain. The retina of our eye contains three types of color-sensitive elements, cones. They react to the length of the color wave in one of the three spectral areas, red, green, and blue. Each cone sends a signal to the brain, and it processes these signals and says something like this. Blue is weak, and green and red are strong, so I see the color yellow. I feel you still don't believe me. Well, so let the brain play this funny game with you right now. It is very easy to demonstrate with the help of three light sources. Red, green, and blue. Now I'll connect them in one point. What color do you see? Well, so whitish. Now I turn off the blue. What color do you see? yellow. At the same time, it is necessary to understand that signals from two spectral colors are coming into our eyes. Red and green. Here they are. And it's only their connection that our brain perceives as the color yellow. This incredible experiment can be repeated endlessly. Mixing red and blue gives you, you have probably already realized that this is my favorite one, purple. Red and yellow give the color orange. Yellow and green are light green. There are tables on where you can see all the variety of shades that are perceived not by our eyes, but by our brain. Now, what do you think? How many shades can the brain distinguish? Alas, science gives different figures, from 150 basic colors to 15,000. Some researchers give a figure of several million color variances depending on different brightness, tone, and saturation. And all these statements are just as striking as they are difficult to verify. Because the brain is really very subjective when perceiving color. Add the emotional state here, it turns out to affect it too. The cultural environment bringing some amendments. In addition, there are things which are in fact inexplicable. Do you remember there was a viral puzzle on the internet? What color is this dress? Let's not repeat that and give a more recent example. 
What color are these flip-flops? I see brownish golden and blue color. And you? Let me guess, black and blue. Gold and white. The producer of the flip-flops claims that they are black and blue. And who's right here? Well, no one. After all, everything relating to color is a purely personal matter. And yet, the flip-flops are brownish blue. I insist. We came to the Academy of Arts, named after V.I. Surikov, with a simple question. What paints do painters paint with today? They were first surprised by the question, but then they thought and answered, hmm, basically there are four kinds. What kind of paint are these? We asked. Also, we got the following list. Watercolors, acrylic, gouache, and oil paint. Excellent, we said. Give us four artists and the four aforementioned sets of paint. We want to conduct an experiment. What kind of experiment? I need to have a portrait made. Whose portrait? <laughs> In our program, people don't ask such questions. Of course, of the author and the presenter of the program, me. Well, since I failed to fit in, let them draw this. the dominance of mass culture, even here. And now, let's be serious. Of course we have chosen four types of paint. Why? Well, because we, being common people, don't understand why these four types of paint exist. Yes, they differ in consistency and in composition, but in fact, perform the same function. They simply reproduce color on paper or canvas. Isn't it easier to come up with and make one universal paint? Or maybe different types of paint show different colors differently. Or artists choose them individually, like we choose clothes and phone models. In general, let them draw and we'll analyze and figure it out later. Let's go to ancient times. After all, people have been drawing for a long time, haven't they? Of course. There are even prehistoric drawings. They are 10 to 15,000 years old. And what kind of colors did people use for them? Now you're going to see three ancient ways of making paints yourself. You won't believe this, but one of the most ancient paints is ordinary clay. Although it might seem to you that the clay has only one color, brown. It's not true. It has lots of shades. Look at this picture and say now that you still look down at clay. But how to get paint from all this, which would be convenient to draw with? So, let's write down the recipe. You'll need glasses, a spoon, water, mortar, of course, a piece of clay, and Arabic gum. What is that? We'll tell later. We powder the clay in a mortal. You can use a glass and a spoon for the same task. Then, dissolve the dry mixture with water. We wait until the sediment settles, then we pour the extra water out. And the output is a reddish pigment. Now it should be mixed with the binder. The binder here is gum arabic, which is a solid transparent resin exuded by various types of acacia. Pour water onto it and the pigment from clay. Voila, your paint is ready. The second popular paint among the ancients was the paint made from ordinary coal. Remember the recipe. Take from the chest of drawers some wooden sawdust, a jar, some volcanic sand, a gas burner, and our old friend, Arabic gum. So, we put some wooden shavings into the jar, we pack everything tight with volcanic sand, close the lid, put it on the fire. Okay, all our items are not exactly authentic, but from the point of view of ancient times, there can be found adequate analogs for them. The wood chips have been charred. We powder them. And now we have the black pigment. We mix it with binder, the same diluted Arabic gum. And our paint is ready. 
straight to the recipe. Take a handful of ammonium dichromate in the nearest chemical laboratory, and you have matches, a burner, and a bowl in your house, I hope, and Arabic gum. Of course, we're being a little cunning. Ancient people can't have had such a substance as ammonium dichromate, obtained by the interaction of chromium oxide with a solution of ammonia available. We just wanted to use something modern when making self-made paints. You will certainly think that the ammonium dichromate must be diluted with water, adding a binder afterwards, but no. Just bring it to the fire. and the ammonium bichromate will turn into a real volcano for a few seconds. Scientifically speaking, this process is called decomposition. Now you think that we'll get the black pigment again. Again, no. This way we get the pigment of green color. Again, the already familiar binder, Arabic gum, is coming into play. And your paint is ready. So the reddish black, green color, full featured paints, and they can be used to paint for sure. And now there will be a short digression into history in order to understand how else people got different paints and colors. Cave people painted what surrounded them, animals, hunters on the rocks. They used materials they had as paints, a natural mixture of minerals, ochre to obtain a yellow shade, Coxids, which are insect larvae, to get the color red. In Mesopotamia, that is, later and in more civilized times, they learned to extract blue dyes from copper carbonate and plants. The green paint was obtained by mixing blue and yellow. Acrylic, watercolor, gouache, and oil. Four artists, four types of paints, one object to draw. And our experiment is an attempt to understand why there is no uniformity in the world of fine arts. How does it turn out that artists choose different paints and techniques for work? Even the colors that they try to convey as close to the original as possible in the end differ from each other. Really? We can already see it now looking at the four portraits and it is obvious that all four will be very different. While our artists continue to draw, we turn to modern paints. How are they produced? In order not to be distracted from the experiment, I'll tell you how the four types of paints used by our artists are produced. In fact, their production is very similar to each other. The target pigment is mixed with the proper binder. Pigment is the color itself. The binder is what makes the paint plastic, easy to be painted with. Look, sure. Acrylic is actually a pigment plus polyacrylate. By the way, acrylic paints are the most modern ones. For oil paints, pigment, linseed oil, and lacquer are used. To make gouache, it is necessary to combine pigment, arabic gum, and titanium mixture. For watercolor, you mix the pigment and arabic gum. In fact, all of the above and all you've seen is only one of the recipes. Different manufacturers can change the composition, but the presence of a pigment and a binder remains unchanged in their recipes too. Without them, you won't get paint in the modern sense of the word. Well, we're back to the artists, and it seems they have finished. Done. I finished. That's it. The portrait's ready. To say that portraits are different is to say nothing. Here, everything is different. Manner, equipment, mood, even color rendering. One has a neater line and a softer tone. Another has it brighter or rougher. And what do the artists think? Why did they choose the paints they were using? Well, say watercolor. Well, it's the only one that may probably reproduce such lightness. That is, it is transparent. Other techniques, they can be done transparently, but not like this. Watercolor is a very live technique. And what will the acrylic fan say? Acrylic paint is the most universal paint. It can be both finishing and liquid, whatever you want it to be. This gives the possibility to make the palette very rich and varied. 
Maybe the one who used gouache will object. Firstly, it is a pain that does not require any additional diluents. That is, it is diluted with water. You can work on paper and cardboard, any surface. In general, for example, oil, you need special paints and the canvas is to be pulled. Acrylic paint may not always be convenient in practice because you need to squeeze it out of tubes. Watercolor is quite a complicated technique, so it is not suitable for everyone. Hmm, the counter-argument of the artist who uses oil paint. Oil, in fact. Here you put some color, put it, and there it lies. That's it. It's like it will be when it is dried. It does not change color. For example, tempera, well, acrylic or gouache. You cannot guess at all. It's like shooting without aiming. That is, you put it, here you look. Yeah, well, the tempera has darkened. Well, acrylic has too, and gouache has become brighter. Do you understand? Our experiment with paints has proved that they, like color, as well as the vision of any image is a very subjective matter. We, that is, each of us, however incredible it seemed, perceive the world in its own way. Our brain, with all other things equal, sees color, light, brightness, and even the outlines of objects individually. Hence these different portraits, hence the difference in the choice of paints. After all, their choice was, in fact, voluntary.